Thanks, everyone. I know this is the last session before you go out for drinks, so we appreciate all your presence. Um, obviously, we're very honored today to have conversation with Bob Zolek, an incredible career and um, just absolutely wonderful things that he's done um, throughout the entire world, including, of course, um, our home country, the States. Um, and Jacqueline and I are going to have a conversation for a bit, and we'd like to include all of you, too. So, We'll open up for questions at the end, but if you can tweet some of your questions to us, we'll grab some of those as well. So, Bob, tell us about your accomplishments while you were at the World Bank. Okay, well, let me just start by uh, thanking all of you for coming, but particularly uh, thanking the students for organizing this. This is my first chance uh, to come to St. Gallen, and uh, you've really done a tremendous job. I'm very much impressed with the way you brought out the sun today after the rain of yesterday as well. <laughs> Um, and I also, I have to give a special thanks to Joe Ackerman, who uh, had uh, asked me when I think he had an honorary chair role. I couldn't make it, but so I promised Joe, so there's a delivery in the St. Gallen account for Joe as well, um, and, uh, and Philip as well for all this uh, help as I had a chance to try to think about ways that I could take part. And I want to say that the, uh, the lab session that we had was particularly stimulating, so I hope you keep using that idea. Um, accomplishments. Um, let me try to mention a couple of approaches because they may give us a little basis for further discussion. Uh, first, this is a little bit of history now, but I came into the World Bank at a time of some turmoil uh, because there had been a leadership crisis and transition not only with the external shareholders, but significantly with the staff itself. And most international civil servants are not used to revolutionary moments, uh, or they're on the other side of them, and they're not used to deposing presidents. So I think one of the first key judgments I had to make was how to get people refocused. Yeah. Because if you have a lot of high IQ people, it's, and they start to get an internal analysis, uh, can take them forever. So I made a judgment about uh, that the people had come to the World Bank were committed to the mission, and mm -hmm. the sooner that I could get them focused on the mission and the clients, the better off we'd be as part of a turnaround. Um, second, to be successful, though, one also has to put points on the board uh, so as to try to suggest that your strategy can get delivered. So one of the key challenges was assembling the resources. So the World Bank has different funding mechanisms, but that for the poorest is called IDA, and we were able to raise some $90 billion from our own internal resources and contributions uh, in two fundraisers over my time. Uh, we created the first capital increase in the bank in over 20 years. And uh, for people who want to have a set of contacts, that's the bank's equivalent to the IMF quota increase, which still hasn't gotten through yet, so we were pleased to get that through. And an area that I know is of interest for you, we tried to tap private sector capital more actively. Third, uh, Shortly after I came to the bank, you had the combination of the food and financial crisis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it was very important to get the bank to be more nimble, uh, innovative uh, in terms of serving clients. And just to give you two examples of that, in the food area, uh, we changed how we did business with humanitarian agencies, agriculture, nutrition, um, and put together some fast funding mechanisms to support clients. On the other side, on the financial one, uh, perhaps of interest to uh, people in Central Europe, we could see that the banking system in many Eastern European countries was dependent on Western European banks and Central European banks, and uh, the flow of capital risks a very great um, sort of uh, negative multiplier effect. So I worked with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development to kind of help get the financial focus on Eastern Europe and make sure that the funding flowed. Um, fourth, a big challenge for any of these institutions coming out of the post-World War II period is the legitimacy, and for a developing uh, an institution dealing with development, it's the role of ownership by developing countries. A lot of people focus on this simply in terms of ownership shares, and we did an adjustment of those shares. But what I found to be as important, if not more important, was the staff, people in senior positions, and critically, always recognizing that the developing countries were the clients. So there's a bit of a challenge of these institutions adapting from a hierarchical model to a more of a network model. Um, 
Another one that I think is very important and reflects the changing environment is uh, connecting to private sector capital. So we could talk about this more, but just to give one example, um, one of the arms of the World Bank is called IFC. It's the private sector arm. We created the first subsidiary of a multilateral institution, an asset management corporation, that took the fact that we also make equity investments and had a rate of return of about 22% on those equity investments. And we created a special fund for Africa with some Latin American investment as well to tap sovereign wealth funds and pension funds. So this was an additional form of capital, but it also served the purpose of trying to draw in to these markets uh, potential investors that would gain familiarity and presumably would follow afterwards. Then there's, I think, one of the other issues that was true of my tenure and my successors is how do you try to identify some of the current issues where you're trying to ad address them but also plant seeds for the future? So for example, um, the special problems of post-conflict states, uh, which we were talking about your work in, uh, which are you have unique challenges of development and governance and, uh, 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 and economics and, and security. Um, oceans. Uh, I was just last weekend with somebody, and this made me feel very nice, is the you know, foundation team of the oceans, and I tried to launch some things because the banks had, had traditionally worked with countries, and so we'd ignored three quarters of the world, the oceans policy. Um, gender issues, uh, a stolen asset recovery initiative, so uh, public-private partnerships and infrastructure, and some of these I think are going to be important for future development and growth, but they'll take time. One in particular that I think um, was important for the World Bank and be important of others is an open data initiative. And w the, the idea here was that the World Bank had incredible data resources going back decades, um, but we used to charge for it. So we, uh, I changed the policy and we opened up 7,000 data sets going back decades. We made all our current uh, project information open. And the logic was we also wanted to eventually make this interactive. So you can go to the website and pull down any project, learn the data. And what I wanted to move towards was something where people in villages with handheld devices would say, this is what you think is going on, but here's what's sort of uh, really going on in the process. Um, another area was in this non-hierarchical model or more networked is how you develop partnerships with other institutions. So I mentioned in the food area um, with some of the civil society groups, faith-based groups, obviously UN organizations. Similarly, I had a lot of background in trade, so we wanted to try to work with the WTO uh, where you spent some time uh, with my friend Pascal Lamy on sort of the trade capacity building, connecting the trade with development. And I guess uh, the last piece is um, while the World Bank uh, is called bank, I sometimes feel that's uh, a, a misnomer because most people associate banks with putting out money, or at least they used to. Um, in reality, what the World Bank also does is develop knowledge products. So you try to develop projects that are important as catalysts, um, but that also capture knowledge that can be used elsewhere. And then what does distinguish you from the OECD or university is then you can come up with innovative forms of investment. So it's an, it was a particularly interesting tenure because I came in during a time of internal crisis, but quickly we had the external financial crisis. And to compliment the staff of the bank, they very much rose to the occasion. Sounds like you were busy. Yes. <laughs> now, in spite of the challenges you faced, obviously you've told us about a lot of your successes, but I'm also curious to know what some of your failures were and what lessons those provide for future leaders of the World Bank. Well, I think it's mainly a question of ongoing learning process and iterative loops. So we were talking about your work in, in uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone. This challenge of... Uh, of post-conflict societies is one that I identified because I saw this in the U.S. government as well, where, to take an example, security people think one of the most important things to get a place stabilized is jobs, particularly for young people, particularly for young men, so they don't uh, cause threats or plant bombs in the road or whatever. And so their uh, attention will be, um, how do we have great jobs. But if you say this to an economist, they'll say, well, that's make work. And we instead, we need to create the property rights, the capital, the contract, and other issues. What one can learn from the experience is uh, you can actually have 
food for work programs. It depends on the wage rate that you have for some of these programs. So I think there's a huge amount to be learned in this area. And just to give you, again, an institutional feel, we created a hub um, in Nairobi, which was in part to bring expertise, not just to sub-Saharan Africa, but other fragile states, but also to, um, to try to learn lessons. Now, obviously, there's a lot of learning in that process. And I, if I go back to other things, you talk about uh, things where I wished it turned out differently. I spent a lot of time dealing with Darfur and, and trying to bring the parties to some resolution uh, with the government there. Um, but I talked about infrastructure. I think if you think of productivity for middle-income countries as well as uh, poor countries, um, there's a lot of one-off projects for public-private partnerships. We tried to create a center in Singapore where we were looking to try to learn lessons from the experience. We actually, with IFC in Singapore, created a capital fund to invest in infrastructure. So I think in all these areas, um, I had another one where I was trying to save the 3,200 tigers left in the world and trying to project with the with the uh, t the tiger range countries. But I think it's the nature of the challenges that you try to advance the agenda, um, but as the very nature of this uh, symposium suggests, there's always work to do. Sure. Following up on that and the notion of the agenda, what is the state of international organizations and their significance now within the development context? Well, uh, I made an allusion to the fact that um, we have an international architecture where many of the multilateral organizations were created in this burst of institutional development after World War II, security as well as economic institutions. Uh, and I think uh, one of the challenges is public institutions uh, sometimes don't have the same bottom line pressure to change, mm -hmm. but it is just as necessary to continue to evolve. So let's take from a couple of different examples. Uh, NATO. Um, many people felt well, at the end of the Cold War, what's the role for NATO? NATO enlarged, and now we understand that given the dangers to the East and with Russia, um, NATO and the countries of NATO will have to be serious about that security guarantee for the Balt Baltic countries or, uh, or Poland or Romania, for example. The IMF, it's easy to forget that prior to the financial crisis, people were wondering if the IMF still had a role. Mm -hmm. well, they actually sold some of their gold stocks to create some, uh, uh, some basis of an endowment for the staff and had to shrink the staff. Well, obviously, it's much more active now. Um, the World Bank adjusting to this sort of network model, working at the regional banks, private sector, civil society groups, development agencies, all reflecting the huge transformation uh, in the system. But I think one insight that I might be able to add on this is a lot of these multilateral institutions, whether it be UN agencies or others, have a governance structure that focuses heavily on participation. Sometimes the voting structure is different, so the bank, the World Bank and the fund have different shares based on roughly size of economy, but there's other factors as well. Um, and there's a danger sometimes that process overcomes the results. And um, sometimes people will feel that as long as everybody got to participate, that that was a good day. But I always try to emphasize that um, accomplishments are also a part of legitimacy. So we're in Switzerland, you had the League of Nations uh, in the interwar period, one state, one vote, nice forms of legitimacy, it didn't work too well. Okay? And so I think there's a particular responsibility for the leaders of these institutions to not only kind of allow people to have their say and engage, but keep pushing on results. Now, sometimes some of this is not earth-shaking, but for example, coming out of the food crisis, we worked with the G20 to try to deal with some things to deal with uh, sort of monitoring of food to try to s also uh, prevent countries from cutting off food flows. So sometimes small steps can make a big difference. Uh, as you also saw uh, in the trade area. So I think one other thing that surprises people about the governance of international institutions is that the same countries that belong to the World Bank, belong to the IMF, belong to the UN, often different ministries, often very different perspectives. And sometimes it was a little amusing to see the representatives of country X in the UN versus at the World Bank and see how they didn't necessarily always share a perspective. Sure. 
So as the countries that... Give me a um, whipsaw here. Yep. <laughs> as the countries that the World Bank's working with become more and more developed, uh, what is the role of institutions, multilateral institutions, um, alongside private sector, and how do they do that effectively? Well, I think, you know, one of the huge changes in development thinking, if you go back to different models of this after World War II, is there was a view of sort of, and it came out of some of the economic theories of the time of the Great Depression about um, the shortage of capital and therefore public capital was going to play this role. And obviously, if you take the World Bank or other development institutions size even in an active year, so taking all the arms together, IDA for the poorest, IBRD lending uh, as part of the General World Bank, IFC, MEGA for risk insurance, 70 to 80 billion dollars in a very big year. That's a drop in the bucket compared to total capital flows. So uh, I think it's important to try to figure out how the World Bank and other development institutions can create an enabling environment for private capital. Some of this is the work along with the governments on basic health conditions, helping children get to school. Um, but part of it is the rule of law, part of its property rights, part of its creating markets and, and opportunities. So we're at a business school, people would uh, this uh, appreciate this is that you know one of the problems in the 90s with the developing countries in the crash was they had a currency mismatch they may have borrowed in dollars and lent in a different currency and so if their currency devalued they had to pay back higher dollars so you're trying to encourage uh, local currency bond markets and capital markets but this point I mentioned about AMC and and IFC is one of the things that under Lars Tunnell who is the Swedish head of IFC we tried to actually develop a lot more um, of assistance, particularly in some of the uh, fragile countries, to sort of what we could do to help with the enabling environment. So it wasn't just investments, but the doing business report is obviously part of these sort of lessons that are learned. Um, and you know, in any market, you have to customize for circumstances. Uh, I talked about public-private partnerships and in infrastructure. Um, so I think what uh, what one has seen is that. You know, take uh, telecommunications in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, 10 years ago, if my recollection serves, there were probably about 10 to 20 million mobile phones. Now there's probably about five to 600 million mobile phones. And what happened was the regulatory system was designed for the fixed line system. It was quite restrictive. Fortunately, the legal structure allowed some entrepreneurs to come in with a mobile phone system. And it vastly expanded not only the service, but then all the things that are built around it. So how Kenya then developed the M-Pesa system for online banking. So the genius of entrepreneurialism uh, certainly exists in the developing world as much as the developed world, but sometimes you have to create and support the enabling environment. So it's a good example of what I was trying to say with the World Bank. It's not the projects themselves, it's how they catalyze other investments and and also share information about what's worked someplace else. Okay, I'm going to ask a question about emerging markets. We've definitely seen a shift in global economics. And so I wanted to understand what some of the challenges you see emerging markets facing in the future and how they can overcome them. Okay, well, good question because uh, I also work in the investment world, and this is a topic that comes up there because there's obviously been a downdraft in some of these markets. And let me start with this point. I think um, I like history as a lesson, and there's still some history from, or some lessons from economic history and cycles. And so in some ways, if you step back and look at the past 10 years, we had about a trillion dollars a year going into developing countries for 10 years. Not surprisingly, that was going to affect asset prices. It was going to affect exchange rates. Um, in some countries, depending on their policies, it might create uh, current account deficits. And frankly, some countries uh, began to read their press releases too much, and they kind of thought that this was ordained because of their brilliance or their fate in life. Um, and they, uh, they, just, they moved away from some of the reform policies that they would want to have. And people here are aware that when you then start to have, that would be a normal cyclical process in a developed or a developing country, but in developing countries, 
the capital mark cross-border flows are a little bit more skittish. And depending on the country, you might not have, if you have a large domestic savings, that can also be a support process. And so you've seen the countries that are most vulnerable of this, although each, you know, whether it's be India, Turkey, Indonesia, South Africa. Um, and uh, each circumstance, however, you have to look on kind of their own terms. What I come back to and what I think will be important in markets is while we're focusing in a lot of discussions about the macroeconomic policies, the unusual monetary policies, fiscal, my work at the bank kept underscoring the work on the microeconomic side and or what people refer to as structural reforms or productivity growth. And so this is the basis for uh, you know, future growth. And to give you uh, a reference point here, um, in 2008 at the World Bank, we went and looked at the uh, 101 economies we had classified as middle income in 1960. So this is 2008, almost 50 years later. Of those 101 economies, only 13 had made it to high income, and one was Greece. So you figure out whether it's 12 or 13. <laughs> and and uh, the, the lesson, you know, some people have talked about this as the middle income trap. Other economists don't like that term because it's basically the question of ongoing productivity. But this is, for example, this work uh, fit into some of the work we did with China, talking about knowledge development. We did a very important project with the Chinese called China 2030 that was the basis for their own structural reforms that you've seen come out of the recent plenum. And the Chinese were very aware of this historical experience, but frankly it's led to a broader discussion in other emerging markets about the need for structural reform. So I think that um, when you look at the potential of developing markets um, beyond sort of today's downdraft, it uh, remains hugely significant. So again, as a reference point, about two-thirds of global growth over the past five years came from developing countries as opposed to under a quarter as recently as the 90s. If you look at exports from developed countries, they in the past 10 years, about 25 per, they've gone from 25% to developing markets to 45 to 50%. The McKinsey Global Institute did this analysis I found interesting, which said, you know, there's now about 2 billion people earning between three and $20,000 a year, not middle class by Swiss standards, but creating a consumer class that represents $12 trillion of purchasing power. So when I deal with executives of many companies, they obviously have to pay attention to the revenues in mature markets, but the growth is not going to be there to the same degree it's going to be in developing markets. So they're trying to figure out the political economy issues, the structural reforms. And to wrap that together, I think what you'll see is, of course, greater differentiation over time. Mm -hmm. and, and those that make the structural reforms will be a, a better investment climate and so some of these, uh, the downdraft you see will get adjusted. So I come from the United States, our neighbor is Mexico, uh, the Peña Nieto government has taken on some bold steps on energy and telecommunications. Now they still have to execute and implement, but you can already see the effect on uh, economic confidence. But at the same time, some of those reforms are gonna take a while to produce benefits, and how do you maintain political support as you do that? So one of the other projects I'm involved with is kind of looking at North America as an economic unit and what else we can do to support. So I think the, the core point is uh, what I've been fortunate enough to see in my career, whether it started in, whether in trade or development, is the developing countries um, are going to be playing a much more significant role. That affects their role in institutions like the World Bank. But at the same time, when you think about the stability of the international system, Many of the, even the so-called middle-income countries are homes to a lot of people earning under $2 a day. So the question is, will, are they willing to assume some of the, quote, responsibilities in the international system that was developed after World War II? And that will be the big, whether it's climate change, whether it's trade, whether it's uh, other development policies, that'll be one of the big tensions in diplomacy in the system. So I've now followed the pattern, so I think <laughs> I flip back here. Yep. Um, so speaking <laughs> about earning, one of the things we've talked about in this clash of generations um, is this idea of jobless growth um, and a bulging population, um, particularly, obviously, a young population. And so 
how do you, and as you know, as someone said earlier today, you know, every politician has jobs on the agenda. How, how does the World Bank and multilateral organizations go about partnering with governments to create jobs? Well, I'm going to speak more generally than from the World Bank since I'm not there anymore and I have to leave <laughs> that to my successors. But I guess I, I would point to uh, three ideas here. Um, first, uh, I think there's a huge opportunity uh, in tertiary education. And wherever I went in developed or developing countries, there was a huge interest in the school to skills to work transition. And this is recognizing the notion of human capital and the value of developing that. Now, at the same time, we've got developments in information technology where we may be able to have educational methods uh, far beyond the traditional campus and school programs. I think, but at the same time, at least in the US, there's been huge cost inflation in education. And so I personally think that's a sector that's ripe for transformation. Um, whether it's a you know, combination of online, hybrid models. I think you'll also see a movement away from sort of degrees that recognize you've gone through certain courses, and, and you'll perhaps see a greater movement towards certification, whether you have sort of abilities and skills. And I, I, I chose tertiary as opposed to higher education because obviously you know, we're near the border with Germany. You've had the history of the apprentice programs mm -hmm. in Germany. I think there's going to be a great experimentation in this. So I look upon that as an opportunity, but so when I connect it to the question of, uh, of jobs for young people, it's a question of how you have that as an ongoing basis to invest in human capital. A second uh, issue is I think as governments or policy try to look about jobs, um, you have to be rigorous in terms of what is your real priority. So. Uh, I've looked at this in the U.S. context because of the trade issues and dislocation. And the United States, for example, spends about $18 billion a year on job training and assistance, 47 different programs, nine agencies, very rarely tested. And, you know, there's a huge amount you can gain in efficiency there. But also, there's a key concept is, do you want to get people in a job or do you want them sort of training separate or is it wage? So we have a debate about minimum wage in the US just as people do in Germany these days. See, I would, my bias would be to get people in jobs and then if I need wage supplements or if I need an earned income tax credit to deal with standard of living, not to have a, a minimum wage that might keep people out of jobs. And the Congressional Budget Office estimated that the type of minimum wage increase, which is very popular in the United States as a general concept, um, would costs about 500,000 jobs. So I think that that's a mistake in terms of how you think about uh, sort of workforce development. And what we're learning is, you know, it, this depends an awful lot on the skill level, but getting people back into the private sector is probably the best place that they can gain from, uh, from the experience. The third observation is, perhaps reflects my uh, uh, sort of contrarian view on this clash of generations that's the theme here, which is that you know, uh, since when is the youth bulge a disadvantage if we've got aging populations and I'm going to need you to pay for my social security, right? So the, right. the point here is, is that I think the youth bulge is actually a huge opportunity as opposed to a drawback because this is a chance for creativity, production, work. And if you actually, when, when one actually disaggregates this youth bulge idea, you know, you asked, does the European Union have a youth bulge? Does China have a youth bulge? I mean, Russia is a country dying demographically. Japan loses about 250,000 people a year. Mm -hmm. So coming back to North America, one of actually North America's strengths is the demographics look a little bit better. Um, so uh, I think one has to be a little careful of this. And even in Arab countries, you're right that there's a bulge now, but I saw the statistics, for example, in Iran and Yemen and others there's a big drop-off, actually, uh, in terms of the birth rates. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, I, I tend to look at this more as understanding the demographics and whether that's an opportunity or for those that are shrinking, are they going to change their policies on social welfare programs? Or are they going to change their policies on immigration? You know, instead try to see how you can match positives to create something uh, a whole greater than the sum of its parts. 
Considering that you are addressing leaders of tomorrow and they really do want to get involved in change, how can young people get involved in changing policy, especially policy that affects jobs and the creation of opportunities? Well, this symposium is a good place to start. It helps to know something. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, look, uh, this depends on, you know, different people's opportunities in life. Um, for this type of audience, and in general in this type of community, you've got huge opportunities. And so if one learns the skills, not only the quantitative, but the qualitative and institutional, there's chances to do something not only in your country or region, but others. As you know from your experience, there's Sub-Saharan Africa, where 25 to 33 percent of the people have electricity, uh, there's some other real basic needs that have to have. And so one can't lose sight of, of trying to have those fundamentals. Um, but in general, I think um, what I would suggest is, as you develop those skills, that you develop a mindset. And I talked about this a little bit in the session I had before my work session. And that is, I think if people see themselves as problem solvers, not just analysts, not just numbers crunchers, not just applying various quantitative skills, but putting themselves in the shoes of a decision maker and saying, if I were that person, what would I need to know to make the decision? I said, told this other audience that George Marshall, who was the chief of staff of the US Army in World War II, but also Secretary of State, founder of the Marshall Plan, used to tell people, look, I don't, I don't need you to ask me what to do, I need you to tell me what to do, trying to push responsibility. And in a smaller way, in the organizations that I worked with, I would say, look, I have no shortage of problems to deal with every day. I don't mind you bringing me additional things I need to know, but what would be your suggestion on how to deal with it? Or if not a possible solution, how about a process that we can move forward? So I, in some ways it seems rather basic, but a lot of people coming out of school still have the sense that they're contributing to somebody else to make the decision. And I guess if there's one bottom line sense of that, I think people who start to see themselves as decision makers or put themselves in the are more likely to become the decision makers. And speaking of decision makers, um, let's talk about women. So you had mentioned gender in the beginning as one of your achievements. Um, what are things that still need to be done going forward to bring women into formal economic processes? Yeah, this is a huge opportunity. And it's also an interesting insight on how multilateral institutions can work because, you know, Bank had, World Bank had 188 shareholders, very different societies, very different uh, attitudes towards uh, ro roles of men and women. The theme that we developed and that I pushed was gender equality is smart economics. Now, I happen to think gender equality is the right and fair thing to do, but the compelling point was, and this is true with a lot of reforms, try to phrase it in terms of self-interest. So if you're the Minister of Finance of a country and I say, look, if you ignore 50... Well, I'm old enough to be now, apparently. You, you, you <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to presume age jokes. I'm explaining <laughs> my age. I just, based on ability. 50% um, of your public is somebody you ignore, then what's it going to do you know, to your chance for your country? Um, and it's interesting whether developed or developing economies. We did a uh, project with the Ethiopian government where we changed the land titles in Ethiopia so they had room for two names. This is not a big costly project, doesn't require large sums of money. And all of a sudden women became co-owners of land and this allowed women to get credit, it allowed to get inputs. Uh, many people may not be aware, women are the prime agriculture producers in Sub-Saharan Africa, so it engaged their own self-interest in the system. On the other hand, uh, if you look at Abenomics today, one of the big issues given the shrinking labor force in Japan will be, will women be more effectively integrated? Um, uh, the finance minister of Sweden, Anders Borg, did a rough analysis saying if women's participation in Japan were roughly equivalent to Europe, so not even Scandinavia, you'd increase the GDP by about 8%, mm -hmm. no small amount. Um, there's other lessons, as, you, know, you know, part of this, when you start to do analytical work, you start to realize, well, you, you have to have the data. A lot of countries didn't uh, connect the data. And then you start to do research. So for example, 
there's a very interesting program started in Mexico, then Brazil. It's called a conditional cash transfer. And the idea is that you, it goes, it's basically for the bottom 15 to 20 percent of the public. Very efficient, about a half of 1 percent of GDP. And the conditions are you need to send your children to school and you need to get health checkups if you're going to get the payment. And one of the things that the researchers learned was that money that went to the women head of household had a much more effective use rate than the men. So you adjust your policy accordingly. And the gender issue, of course, you know, while we phrased it in terms of women, it also there's issues that young boys face. I mean, so with the Millennium Development Goals now, you're actually finding women sort of in, uh, in larger numbers going on to higher education and some issues. So it's just being aware and differentiating. But the other part of it is then what you learn from one dimension of this may have broader a applicability. So we went from youth bulge to work to shortage here with demographics. What I saw that in developed countries, the types of changes you would need to help women sort of have active careers if they wanted to uh, take time off for children, come back and others, required greater flexibility in terms of going into the job every day, e-commutes, other things very similar to what you would need to keep older people in the workforce because they may not be able to commute as easily in the process. So frankly, if you think about this from the perspective of, a, of an executive, you know, these are very talented people. Do you want to lose them? Or can you be a little creative in kind of how you are able to work with them in a way that sort of builds on their productivity, whether because of age or whether because of gender and sort of other family demands? So. I find this, again, um, there's a lot of things that if you turn the problem and make it into an opportunity, you can find a lot of mutual wins. Absolutely. Okay. To conclude our questions, and just to recap on what you talked about in your last session, can you please give us all advice for leadership for the leaders of tomorrow? Nice and it's and unfortunate question. the whole crowd couldn't come yeah. to the last session. No, no, no. But. Well, um, I pointed out the problem solving, which is probably uh, a general uh, point to start. Uh, this varies a lot by um, skill and preference. Some people are going to want to do deep dives in various areas. I guess what I would suggest is um, if you talk about leadership skills in particular, um, the broader your base of knowledge and experience, uh, probably the greater set of insights. So various, I can, I can draw it in my own case. I started out with sort of history as a background, economics, law, finance, executives. I think it gives you a framework for asking questions and trying to figure out ways that one can lead and motivate people understand whether it's a workforce issue, the different perspectives people might bring. You know, the World Bank is, is a very interesting executive challenge because you have people there from about 180 different countries, all different experiences. And so you have to be alert that different cultures are going to sometimes respond in different ways, even though they're unified with a common mission, often with similar or common training. But I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was... Um, meeting with some Vietnamese government representatives at a time of reform. Uh, their the reform process was kind of at a critical point. And it was a meeting where they were asking in all sincerity, you could almost tell, kind of about the idea of using the market, and building the private sector. I thought I could answer this question, but wouldn't it be better if I turned to my chief economist, who was from China, I brought in the first chief economist from the developing world, to talk to them about use of markets in private sector, and he gave a big endorsement. Now, one had to be sensitive about China-Vietnamese <laughs> issues, but, but in general, which are in the news today, I see. Uh, but, but in general, part of this is you can tap different, if you get it right in a multilateral institution, you've actually got a far wider range of things. So I'd apply that more generally, I think, is that uh, the challenge of continuing to learn, continuing to ask questions, but um, problem solve and focus rigorously on results. So my point about governance in developing institutions or if you're in a private sector company, 
if you don't perform, you're not going to be an executive very long. Um, and so you're going to have to have an idea of different patterns of results uh, over time periods as you build an institution, respond to shareholders and staff and community and others. Okay. Great. Thank you. Shall we take some questions from the audience? Is everyone? I, sorry, I can't really see. There we go. All We're right. blinded, so. <laughs> All right, we'll see right down here in front, the lady in front. And would you be kind enough just to tell me your name or where you're from? Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for sharing with us. My name is Helena. I'm from Russia, but I'm doing PhD in economics in French engineering school. And my question was about private sector and private-public partnerships. Well, we are talking as about the smartest way to invest in the future. And one of the ways from from my point of view, it's not only my, my point of view, is long-term investments. And uh, the question is, uh, how can we create economic incentives on the current in the current market situations to promote these long-term investments? Well, you started with public-private partnerships, so let me talk about that a little bit, because I also alluded to that. Um, this was a trendy term in the United States about 40 years ago. And one always has to be careful about trendy topics. <laughs> but but uh, what I've observed is that, as I suggested with infrastructure and other topics, there's some real win-win possibilities and creative ventures there. But you also have to be rigorous because um, there's always the risk that certain economic interests or special parties or oligopolies or oligarchies will be uh, position the public-private partnership so that the public takes the risks and the private takes the profits. That's not very sustainable. Um, it may be sustainable for them, but not necessarily politically. So in each case, you really have to drill down and try to understand what would be the appropriate risks and how you manage it. So in our, we had a lab session when we were talking about the role of um, banks financing small and medium-sized enterprises after natural disasters. And we were playing through a little bit about for how long, what risks, um, is there a stop loss, why doesn't the insurance industry take care of this? And I, we were trying to nudge towards the idea that there could be a role for the private sector, but also perhaps for some uh, insurance at, at certain levels of this process. Um, uh, when I was at the World Bank, we worked with the Caribbean to create a, uh, uh, a sort of a hurricane and disaster insurance, and you've got catastrophic bonds. Um, Jacqueline's partly from Zambia. In, in Malawi, there's, um, it's a heavily producer of corn and maize, so it depends on the rains for that year. So we actually did rain index futures. Uh, so there's lots of possibilities there, but one has to be careful about kind of how you're sharing the overall load. Uh, more generally, uh, as you try to think about uh, sort of innovative combinations, I think um, you can look at enabling environments, as, we, as I talked about, and how to try to create opportunities for the private sector to take advantage of those. And some of this may be the human capital development, some of it may be the rule of law and others. And we were talking a little bit beforehand something that uh, for the graduates of St. Gallen might encounter more. In the service sector, if you think back 20 years ago, many countries had state-owned telecommunication systems um, or uh, uh, some other service sectors that were eventually privatized. Um, and I think you're going to see in educational services, in health services, in other sectors, uh, a greater effort by private innovation. And then there'll be the challenge of with what quality standards, how do you have proper regulation without choking it off? So, and this goes a little bit uh, to Jacqueline's question when we were talking about the middle income trap. So what we've seen is service sector productivity is very important for developing countries as they move beyond agriculture and manufacturing. So again, I think this is one of these areas of innovation and I think having a sense of the public policy environment while trying to encourage private sector entrepreneurship is a powerful combination. Gentleman right here. Uh, 
Hi, um, thanks. Um, thanks for the uh, micro and micro perspectives of how some of the um, investments worked effectively in some countries and some did not. I'm Rama from Singapore, and I'm going to share some questions with you on uh, from an environmental perspective. We don't have much time left, so if you can right? limit it to one question, that right. would be great. Just one. I want to ask a question, maybe not environmental, but social, on social causes. Can socially responsible investments be leading to um, sustainable economic activity in the directions, in the context of our leaders of tomorrow? Well, Ani likes this question because this is her, she wanted to ask this question, so she must have put you up to this. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, the short answer is, of course, yes. <laughs> but I, I want to I play with this one a little bit because I talked about this with Ani, because we're near the German border. Um, many people refer to the social market economy of Germany. Okay? And it sort of today conveys a notion of market economy, but with a social conscience. Okay? It's interesting to go back and look where that term came from. It came from a man named Ludwig Erhard. And Ludwig Erhard, uh, who was a uh, 19th century liberal, in, uh, helped was create the German economic miracle after World War II. Man that led the currency conversion. A huge sort of architect of Germany's success. He was the one that coined the phrase social market economy, and he partly did it because at this time there was a debate with more pure socialism, national ownership, and he was trying to make the case that the market economy provides social benefits too. So my starting point with your uh, point is, is that, uh, let's take in mind what I was talking about with education. Um, can we consider whether the role of, of profit making and competition in education and healthcare also has a role, or does it all have to be government provision? So the market economy properly sort of regulated, properly standards also provides a series of social functions. What, there's an also a dimension when we're talking about long-term thinking. Um, you know, if you're running a company, you've got your shareholders, but you also have to think about your brand. You have to think about your customer base. You have to think about your employees. Many companies find that socially responsible activities allow them to have a better workforce, an interesting workforce. So those are dimensions. The, but at the same time, this is where it may reflect my kind of view of these issues on a range. You have to be a little careful of whether kind of social responsibility becomes sort of one person's club to stop somebody else from doing something. Okay, so look, here's a very sensitive issue. Um, you've got universities all across the United States now that don't want companies to invest in any fossil fuel development, okay? Because they don't think it's socially responsible given climate change. Um, we just talked about electricity in Sub-Saharan Africa. Some people don't want hydro development there. And so kind of what's left for these people? And so uh, natural gas development in the United States has actually reduced, at least for now, uh, some of the carbon development. So I'm just saying, one has to be a little careful with these phrases. While one can make them as part of marketing, part of a, uh, a policy environment, um, now and then they can also be used for advocacy agendas, and that's fine, but just know what you're doing. So that actually leads quite well into one of the questions we got on Twitter, which is around resource-rich developing economies and how they have paths towards sustainability. About what? Resource-rich resource, developing yeah. economies. Yeah. Um, so what are the paths for them towards sustainable futures? Okay, well, this is a good connection with that, uh, exactly, is that, um, you know, what we've seen in the development field, and this is, now it's in the headlines in sub-Saharan Africa, but it's true everywhere, is, is that um, it's often a very difficult development path because it can lead to imbalance in the economy, uh, it can affect your exchange rate, just as the Swiss are having to deal with a lot of money coming into the Swiss franc and that could hurt your export industries. Um, if you don't have it uh, in an open and transparent way, you're not, uh, you, you could uh, get a lot of corruption. Uh, it can undermine your government system. So, um, you know, a number of people uh, have written uh, about sort of the lessons we've learned about how to try to deal with resource development. And it's not hopeless. So if you look at Canada or Australia's economy, I mean, those are, those are heavily still resource developed economies that have figured out ways to manage this in a way, whether it be exchange rate or 
even with Australia and Canada, you can see its effect on exchange rate. So um, the, for uh, some of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa now, the question is not so much financial resources, it's the governance uh, that's associated with the economic development, which is how you spend a lot of your time. My name is Joyce Meng. I'm from New York City. My question relates to um, one aspect. I guess as a response to the structural adjustment programs that the World Bank has done in the past and the criticism to that, and the World Bank shifting more to a more giving more greater autonomy to individual countries to participate and shape their own poverty reduction programs, in light of this, how do you think the global community and also the multinational institutions should think about addressing the conundrum that the countries with the greatest need are those who have the least capable institutions to handle and develop their own aid programs and deliver it effectively? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I would say the good news is um, you've seen a huge transformation in capacity in the developing world in my sort of professional lifetime. Um, and in all regions of the world. And so you've got, in not only at the ministerial level or the senior civil service or others, you're developing uh, some very important capacities. But let me drive down on the sub-piece of this. One of the things that I discovered at the World Bank is that um, if you're dealing with a big country, often a big country that's just gone through a democratization process, this was sort of the case with Indonesia or after uh, Brazil, is that, um, just about the time that the central government is developing expertise, they're decentralizing authority to states or provinces, and they often don't have the same capacities. So one of the answers to your question is, um, in the case of Brazil, for example, the World Bank adjusted its programs to work with the states of Brazil. The federal government had to permit this so that we could help develop the capacity including sort of the good governance and anti-corruption and the results orientation. So you need to design uh, the programs um, to try to fit uh, the overall circumstances. When I visited China, the, Ch uh, the World Bank had a very good relationship with China, starting with Deng Xiaoping and Robert McNamara. And I remember visiting a forestation project. And this one official said to me, you know, it was really great what this did for the forests and the water and others. He said, but what we learned here about procurement, what we learned here about public accounting systems, we were able to apply much more broadly. So I think the core issue which you're focusing on is that there's a much greater recognition about the role of institutions and governance in the development process. Now this has led to and a sort of an amusing debate among scholars because the political scientists of the world sometimes object that the economists are now discovering institutions. Okay? But to be fair, many of the political scientists had, math, had sort of uh, mathematic economic envy, so the type of work that they were doing in research was so far divorced from reality, the economic people moved into their space. So, there's some people at MIT and others who actually got a lot of attention on this, uh, Darren Asimeglu is one, for writing this types of, of work. And, uh, and I think it's gonna become increasingly important whether it comes from the political scientists or the economists. And the reason I'm putting in this little anecdote is, uh, look, I'm a policy practitioner and an executive, but I try to stay in touch with academic disciplines. And one of the things that's frustrated me over time is some of the pure university environments have moved so far away from work that can be a practical use that, um, that neither I or the ministers or others I was working with could apply it. And I think that's a shame. So you've seen, frankly, business schools like this one or public policy institutions or others sort of move into that space, and I'm glad that they have. Great. Um, I think we have to wrap up to let everyone go. Um, so I think um, both Jacqueline and I have really enjoyed this. And thank you so much, Rob, for being here. And thank you for the organizers um, for allowing us this opportunity. My pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you.